So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to help you celebrate the 10th anniversary of CHIPAC. Actually, my association with this place goes back much farther. Uh, in 1979, uh, I was an undergraduate here and I uh, had a summer job working in Bert Richter's group. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, that was in the days where you know, undergraduates were allowed to like handle radioactive sources and things like that. Uh, and then as a, as, as a senior, actually, I carry out an experiment at the spear, one of the spear interaction regions, and probably most of you don't even remember what spear was, but some of you do. Um, and uh, we did an experiment, and I think that those two experiences convinced me that being an experimental physicist was just way too hard. You had to stay up late, do shifts and stuff, so I, I went into theory. Uh, I then came back here as a postdoc in the Slack theory group. Uh, in the mid to late 80s, and I think the reason I was hired was because there had been this other postdoc here who had written this interesting paper on inflation uh, in the Slack theory group, so I think they were hoping for like a repeat of that, and of course that didn't work out. So, uh, so basically after I left, I think it took them 15 years before they sort of uh, had enough gumption to get back into astrophysics and, and started KIPAC. So, uh, Anyway, so it, and it's been great over the last 10 years to see the evolution of, of all this great activity, uh, including uh, the really major contributions that people here have made uh, to this project, the Dark Energy Survey, which started survey operations um, uh, last Saturday. And so I thought I would just play a little snippet of this. I don't know if the, uh, if the sound is up. Oh, here we go. Working to help commission the new dark energy camera. Can you hear that? Installed on the Blanco telescope. The whole purpose of our, our project. So is this is a kite pack. What right, is yeah. dark energy? Dark energy uh, was discovered just uh, less than 15 years ago, actually. In fact, using in part this this very telescope, and it was discovered by its effect on the universe. So dark energy is our name. It's just a name that we give to the phenomenon that's causing the universe's expansion to accelerate. So that, out that's Brian Nord on a bad hair day. Um, so I think we'll stop this. Anyway, so um, so I'm really appreciative of, of really all the work that's gone on here um, in the Dark Energy Survey, um, and so I was going to spend the first few minutes. Which one is it? Oh. You can get the, you can get the PowerPoint. Yeah, there we go. Great. So I wanted to spend a, a few minutes talking about the Dark Energy Survey and then segue into these uh, discussions uh, and hopefully stimulate some, some discussion from, from everyone. Um, so, right, why is the universe speeding up? Is it dark energy? Is it uh, something going on with gravity? Um, I, I think one point to stress is that um, you know this field actually has made a lot of progress over the last 15 years. I think um, you know the, the the outer picture was where we were in the late 90s uh, with the discovery, uh, and the inner picture is where we were a couple of years ago. Now with not just supernovae but other sorts of of measurements that you've been hearing about all morning, uh, and so we've made real you know I think tremendous progress. But there's still of course more to go. This is assuming that, of course, it's, it's a cosmological constant that's driving the accelerated expansion. If we open that up and allow it to be something with a more generic equation of state that's either constant or time varying, uh, you know, then the constraints uh, are, are significantly weaker, but still, you know, has still gotten interesting over the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, so the Dark Energy Survey is one of this new generation of project uh, that's really aiming to use a multiplicity of techniques uh, to try to get at this question by doing a really big, deep galaxy survey. Uh, and so we want to use all of the techniques we've heard about this morning, plus others, supernovae, uh, uh, large-scale galaxy clustering, uh, to throw at this problem. Uh, so in order to do that, we're going to carry out, well, we have started carrying out this, uh, I, you know, I've been used to years talking about this thing in the future, and now it's great to actually talk about it in the present. 
Uh, so we've started, we've embarked on this 5,000 square degree four band survey, roughly 24th magnitude. Uh, somebody said 26, you know, if you want to go from 10 sigma galaxy to five sigma point source, that's fine with me. Um, and plus a time domain survey uh, over 30 square degrees in four of the bands to find several thousand supernovae. In order to do such a survey with a current facility, uh, well, with the current telescope, uh, we had to build this new camera, um, three square degrees field of view, 570 megapixels, uh, and install it on the Blanco telescope. Um, and, uh, and we've been, in exchange for delivering that instrument for the community, we've been awarded 525 nights to do the survey over the next five years, starting last Saturday. Um, and so again, uh, we've been hearing a lot about this already. I won't go into detail. You know, on the order of 100,000 optically identified galaxy clusters uh, to redshifts of order one, uh, synergizing with uh, Sonyev Zadovich experiments from the South Pole, also synergizing with near infrared data from, uh, from various VISTA surveys uh, being done at ESO, weak lensing shape measurements for about order 200 million galaxies. Uh, large-scale structure measurements, including BAO for a border of 300 million galaxies, and several thousand uh, well-measured type 1a light curves. Uh, I'm going to skip over. You've heard all these things already, so I'm going to skip that over that. Uh, we, haven't, we didn't hear a, a talk this morning about BAO, so I just want to mention, in this kind of survey, of course, we're just, uh, we, uh, with photometric redshifts, you don't have the, the resolution. Uh, to measure the radial mode of baryon acoustic oscillation, so we're just measuring it in angular clustering in photo Z bins. Uh, that still gives you some sensitivity uh, to dark energy, but of course this, this isn't, it's not competitive with, with a spectroscopic survey. Uh, and then the last uh, method, which I think wasn't discussed this morning, uh, is supernovae. Uh, and uh, I think the point here I want to make is just we're, with this survey uh, and with large future surveys, we're really entering a different regime of supernova cosmology. Up to this point, we've been able to do supernova surveys where we've had enough follow-up time uh, such that we've, we've done cosmology with spectroscopically classified supernova samples. And the type 1a supernova doesn't, you know, traditionally meant, you know, a, a spectrum with a certain set of features in it. Um, we're now going to, we're moving well beyond that where we're simply not going to have the resources uh, to measure spectra of the supernova while they are bright. Uh, and so we're going to rely on photometric classification of light curves uh, and spectroscopic follow-up of a small sample of things while they're bright, plus spectroscopy then of, of host galaxies uh, over the long term to get more precise redshifts. Uh, and so, so the field is moving into this qualitatively different regime, uh, and we have to be you know, aware that um, that implies some limitations. Uh, it does mean that our system of classification is not going to be as precise uh, as it was before. And in particular, it means that um, you know, we will have uh, contamination from other supernova types in our samples. So this is an example of an analysis that was done uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey supernova uh, sample, where we had a large sample of hundreds, actually more than this, 500 spectroscopically confirmed 1As, uh, plus, you know, many hundreds more of fainter, mostly fainter, uh, photometrically identified 1As. Um, and so we've done a lot of work to simulate these and uh, really understand uh, how to make uh, uh, data selections and classification uh, purely with, with photometric information. And I, and I think it will I think it will work for a survey like PES. Okay, so just to, um, I want to get to the discussion. So we had um, uh, this project, I should say, really started in 2003 when we first conceived it. At, at that time, the NOAO put out an announcement of opportunity for development of a new instrument for the Blanco telescope uh, at CTIO. Um, uh, we installed the, uh, the instrument in 2012. Uh, installed the imager then uh, uh, about a year ago uh, and had first light on the sky uh, September 12th, 2012, uh, not September 11th, um, and uh, took some nice uh, iconic images of the sky and got a lot of good press, including on the Tonight Show. 
Um, and then basically uh, there was a period of commissioning and then several months of what we call science verification where we were actually carrying out survey op, uh, observing in a mode very similar to what we are actually doing now in regular survey operations. And this science verification phase was really an extended period of commissioning, uh, an extended period of tuning and tweaking both the instrument and also the fact that this, you know, this is a 40-year-old telescope which had a lot of upgrades made to it and so those were also being tested and refined uh, and improved during this period as well. Uh, so during this phase we carried out um, observations mainly in two regions of 100 square degrees or so um, uh, to uh, close to our full depth of the completed DES uh, in order to test systematics um, and really exercise the system. Um, and uh, we've been uh, analyzing those data since then and in fact next week we expect to have our kind of final internal release of the process data uh, from these uh, science verification observations. So this was extremely useful, uh, this several month period uh, in really developing the whole system uh, and making sure we would be ready when the survey starts, uh, started uh, a few days ago. Um, so is there a way to hit the lights really quickly? I just, I, is there any way to, there, it's all blacked out. Ah, oh, great, excellent. So this is kind of the OOI picture. Um, so this is the DCAM focal plane. Uh, and this is uh, a composite, I think this is a GRI image from one of our uh, supernova fields. We have 10 supernova fields. Two of them are, are deep, eight are shallow. Uh, they'll, they'll be all, each of them visited every few nights. Uh, and of course, we'll do difference imaging to find new objects, but you also will stack them to make very deep uh, ex uh, coad exposures as well. So this is just an early coad of, of one of those, uh, of one of the, the deep supernova fields. Um, just, and uh, here's a zoom in. Uh, during science verification, we were in survey mode, but we also zoom, uh, took images of a few known clusters. This was a, an SPT cluster at a redshift of about 0.3. So there are about 50,000 galaxies. This is about a square degree on a sky. So this is a portion of the DCAM focal plane and just zooming in, you can see the, you know, the red sequence of this, this cluster here. Um, and so people have been starting to mine these data and when we have our, our release next week, uh, that, that activity will really uh, get underway. But so here's work uh, led by people here at KaiPAC uh, using uh, red sequence to identify uh, high redshift clusters. So this is a a redshift 0.8 or 0.9 cluster uh, that, that Eli and company found. This is from data we took back in, uh, from in the science verification phase in November. Uh, we've heard a lot about weak lensing and cluster weak lensing. Uh, and we've also heard that you know, doing cluster weak lensing is easier than cosmic shear. So of course, it's one of the first things you try. So this is another cluster, I forget which, which one, uh, where we have DCAM imaging and then the contours superimposed on that is uh, a surface mass density uh, reconstructed from weak lensing uh, and uh, uh, looks, you know, looks quite reasonable. So, um, so this is sort of a first indication of, of using this system to measure galaxy shapes in a cosmologically interesting way. Uh, and this is quite nice because during this phase, uh, the science verification phase, we knew there were actually a number of issues going on with the system. The telescope was not tracking perfectly. Uh, there were guiding issues, et cetera. So the fact that we were able to do something like this at all, uh, you know, within a couple of months, based on data taken basically a couple of months after the camera was put on the telescope was, uh, was quite reassuring. Uh, and since then, the data quality uh, has, has gotten substantially better. Uh, we also exercised the, uh, the, the time domain survey. Uh, and so here's uh, a zoom in on a region uh, where we found uh, uh, supernova. We have uh, hundreds of supernova candidates. We had very limited spectroscopic time scheduled last fall. Uh, so we confirmed a handful of, of type 1A and other types of supernovae. Uh, but there are, over the next five years, our collaborators in Australia have 100 nights of, t of time on AAO that have been awarded for spectroscopic follow-up in the supernova fields, uh, going after both active supernovae supernova host galaxies, other sorts of targets. 
So that's, that should be a very rich data set in itself. Okay, this, the survey started uh, Saturday, uh, and we've had a, a little bit of press, including uh, locally here in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, so, and, uh, um, so that's, that's going well. Uh, so basically, um, uh, the survey is now roughly 1% done. Uh, so we just have 99% to go. Uh, so, so, you know, so all the hard stuff has been done and it's, uh, it should be smooth sailing from here. So I think that, that's all I wanted to say. Maybe we can bring the lights back up. Uh, that's all I wanted to say about DES and, uh, and I wanted to now, I think, immediately segue. I don't think we need to do questions um, on this uh, into these discussion questions and I'm hoping so I think in, in other sessions you've brought people forward for these things. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of sort of having pundits sit in the front, so I'm hoping that instead we can just simula stimulate general discussion in the audience. Uh, and if people don't pop up, then I'll, I'm gonna like, you know, point the laser pointer in your eyes or something. Um, so I, we had this set of questions, I think Mustafa mentioned at the beginning, um, that I'm hoping people will respond to. Uh, and so the first ones are sort of aimed at the, the theorists, and uh, unfortunately I don't see Lenny here. Um, but there's certainly, uh, well, so I, I can pick on Iggy because he, he talked about this as well. Uh, so there clearly is, at least in some segment of the, of the community, this theoret what I would call theoretical prejudice that lambda is, is the origin of cosmic acceleration. It's clearly the simplest explanation. Uh, it's, it's consistent with all the current data. Um, on the other hand, I think many of us believe that there was an earlier epoch of accelerated expansion, some fraction of a second after the Big Bang. That's consistent with all the data as well. Um, and so um, if I imagine a bunch of theorists sitting around 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, the universe is just starting to inflate, and they're all sitting in a room like this, and they're all saying, oh yeah, of course it's the cosmological constant and I even have an anthropic explanation for why it's, you know, four orders of magnitude below the Planck scale or something. And, you know, of course, uh, it's obviously going to be the cosmological constant. And, you know, and so for at least 50 or 60 E-folds um, uh, or more, they would have been, you know, they would have been, that would have been a good bet. Uh, but eventually that epoch of accelerated expansion ended, uh, which is not what would happen if it's lambda. Um, so I personally feel that having, uh, having been wrong once is not a good argument for being right the second time. Um, <laughs> that's, that's just my prejudice. Um, so I don't know if, if people want to, if, if people have thoughts on that, maybe if there are responses to that. I then, I then had a second thing on sort of dark energy model building, but maybe if, if, if there are any responses uh, on that one. Because it's certainly a general assumption that, uh, you know, that lambda is, the, is sort of the, the null hypothesis here. And the, my question is, why should we be making that assumption? Okay. The perspective is slightly different in the sense that the argument that is used to argue for the anthropic argument for the cosmological constant at late time just wouldn't tell you anything at early times. And just right. because there were no observables, no, no observers, uh, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the way we understand observers. So in that sense, I'm not sure what you mean by being wrong or not. It's not that that way of reasoning was proved wrong in other situations. Is the well, conclusion no, the, the that point you... Is we, we've had, we think we've had one epic of accelerated expansion, right. which was not driven by lambda. So why does that make us assume that this epic of accelerated expansion must be driven by lambda? Yeah, I think that the logic is that you have a certain reasoning, anthropic reasoning. I'm, I'm not necessarily defending that, but this is the logic. And that reasoning allows you to make a conclusion at late times based on anthropic that the cosmological constant has to be close to the value observed. And it allows you to make no conclusion whatsoever about the value of the cosmological constant at early times because there were no observers. So in this sense, uh, yeah, you just use it when it does give you an answer and you don't use it when it doesn't. Uh, so so it's, it's like, I think there is a slight yeah, nuance I wasn't, on... I wasn't actually trying to get at the anthropic, the anthropic thing here. I'll, 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 I'll dig at the anthropic principle in a couple of other, a couple of slides. Is there a natural prediction from the fact that inflation ended, that the current acceleration will end? 
And in fact, isn't there, I mean, isn't, isn't, I don't know, I, I, I'm an outsider on this, but I, I, there have been uh, Booth Oats group, don't they have results that suggest that in the, sometime in the next 10 to the minus 20 seconds or something, we should switch to new vacuum? Like, isn't that a <laughs> natural that prediction? <laughs> isn't that a natural prediction of these, uh, these models where there's multiple? Oh, I see. With you mean the landscape model? Yeah, I mean, in the sense that we've dropped, we were in one for many e-foldings. Now we're going into another one. Maybe we'll be here for a few e-foldings. But isn't it natural to believe that we're going to go into future e -fold, future? Right. I don't know. So don't buy green bananas. No, well, I just, I just, uh, I think, I think the important thing is uh, that uh, what I, what I tried to say during my talk, which is that you have to be very careful about the fact that you don't, in the end, try to explain the cosmological constant using a model which itself contains a cosmological constant. I think this is the, I, I think this is, so this is the, to a large extent, I think the problem with, with the, so I guess that's point two here, model building, and that we are in the end, basically just frequently taking the problem that we have and putting something else on top of it and calling it something else. Right. I think this is the, I'm not sure whether there really is a very compelling model that would do anything else. Right. So th that actually sort of gets to the, my second, well, yeah, maybe, we, yeah, sorry, go ahead, yeah. <clears throat> but I just wanted to, to tr address the difference between early time and, and late time. So e in, in early time, we could imagine trying to cut off these loops. So as Lenny was emphasizing, there's loops that were normalized, the cosmological constant. And you could really, you can legitimately, there are symmetries that will cut those loops off. Like supersymmetry naturally controls the value of the cosmological constant. And so if you apply that, so you said, oh, during inflation, maybe there was supersymmetry. And since the scale could be as high as the gut scale, it seems completely, completely reasonable. Um, so now if you applied that same logic today, you'd say there should be supersymmetry broken at the scale of the cosmological constant, which is, you know, 10 to the minus 3 EV. And we know that there's no new particles, or we haven't seen anything that looks like supersymmetry at that scale. And there's no evidence that something's coming in to cut off those loops. So because we've probed higher energy scales, we've seen new particles with masses above this, the scale of the cosmological constant, we can't just modify physics to, to fix the problem where we could imagine doing it with, with inflation. Um, so I think that's what makes, makes the, the situations very different. Um, in the in the sense that no model a model builder can do whatever they want to fix the problem in inflation, but they can't do it right now with with the cosmological constant. Well, but we don't know that there isn't new hidden physics, you know, hidden sector things the, at at these low energy but they're scales. Right? They're, so those are, I mean, it's it's totally possible, and people pursue that direction as well. But they're very hard to 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 make those compatible with um, equivalence principle tests. Because the, the loops that you know we're coupling to gravity, they they affect things like binding energies inside protons or inside atoms, and we test those. And so if we cut off those loops, we'd be saying part of the energy that's contributing to the energy of an atom is not gravitating if we just try to cut off those loops. So it's it, people definitely seriously take that uh, take that idea seriously and try and pursue it, but it's been there's been very little progress writing a model that doesn't have very serious experimental or theoretical problems. You, you, you could definitely use that to, to, you still have to explain the zero, right? Like if you could explain why lambda equals sure. zero, I think, like if someone came up with a beautiful explanation for a lambda had to be zero, then we would think about string theory axions and something like, you know, quint quintessence. But I think that, that that's, that's, you know, that doesn't yeah. solve the first problem. That's where some of us started out in this field, yeah. Actually, can I just ask a quick question? I mean, there's many good reasons why lambda has to be small, right? It can't be too large. But is there any good argument, uh, in, in, or any argument, <laughs> anthropic argument, why it has to be larger than zero? Because um, is there one known? I thought George uh, Staffy made had made anthropic arguments that pointed to a non-zero. But, but I'm not remembering the argument at the moment. Oh, I see. Okay, well now that we've solved that problem, um, 
I, I had some sort of, uh, again, this was, I mean, you were sort of talking about this before. I, I, it, it's always, it's bugged me a bit that somehow um, early in the days of inflation, sort of the, the high energy physics union sort of imposed on, on all their members the rule that, you know, we use effective Lagrangian and symmetries and, and, you know, we didn't just write down arbitrary potentials for inflatons. And somehow, you know, when we got to, to quintessence model, you know, all that, you know, there was like anything goes. There was, you know, the, the union rules had just totally broken down. And uh, so I'm just, uh, so you, I think you, you, you were sort of touching on, on why that's happened. Uh, but it's not obvious to me that that, that had to happen. But anyway, I think we should move on because I've got a few other questions. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, you know, when I was a, a student, you know, there was this interest in um, sort of, you know, dynamical relaxation models to kind of get rid of vacuum energy. Weinberg kind of proved eventually this kind of no-go theorem for those. People have sort of tried to get around that. Uh, but then sort of in recent years, it's all, it's, you know, it's, it's all gone anthropic. And so does that mean that we have, you know, is that, is, is the anthropic principle really the only game in town? Do we really think, are we not clever enough to think of physical models uh, that, will, that will solve the cosmological constant problem? So I, I've sort of decoupled from sort of the theoretical side of this in recent years. So I don't know if people are still trying to do that uh, and where that's gotten to. So is, is there any, any wisdom on that? I guess the fact that people are doing anthropic stuff means probably not, but, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I just have a question about it, which is that um, how much work has gone into actually computing the vacuum energy density in the, in the model? I mean, oh, the, the descriptions I always see is like people draw a few diagrams and say, well, there's an infinite number of them, so if you add them up, it's got to be an infinitely large number. Uh, but in principle, you can actually just compute the diagrams, right? I mean, you could probably go to quite high order. And how far have people gotten? And I mean, maybe when you compute them, they just all add up to something. Oh, small. you're saying cancel it? You know. No, I mean, I don't think it will. But I was just wondering, what's the status of it? The problem, problem is always stated in this naturalness way, and not right. with the numbers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Any comments? So actually, I, unfortunately, I've forgotten the old, quite embarrassing, but I have seen a, a, somebody trying to the, the lambda and standard model. And um, there are all kinds of issues to do with the fact that uh, if you put your cutoff at n Planck, it's not Lorentz invariant, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, if you go through this, you end up getting a number that's, uh, it's not 120, but it's 64, I think. So, and any which way, you know, there's now the Higgs, which is 246 GV or something like that, right? So. So no one here has a, a solution to the cosmological constant problem. <laughs> right, can we put that on the agenda for Chi Pack at twenty? And, okay, I, I want you to solve that in the next ten years. So I, you know, I'm there's there's all this stuff about the anthropic principle. The, the only thing I want to say about it is um, uh, that you know we we have uh, earlier examples in the history of physics. So there was this famous paper in 1973 by Collins and Hawking. Uh, where they formulated a solution to the flatness problem eight years or whatever before on Guth, and it was, you know, the anthropic principle. Um, and um, that's fine, and you can say that's a perfectly fine solution. However, you know, imagine if we had just stopped there, right? And then, you know, Alan Guth as a postdoc here at Slack, you know, just wouldn't have bothered to have, you know, written down inflation, and, and we wouldn't have this whole, you know, most of us wouldn't be here probably. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, to my mind, the, the anthropic solution isn't, you know, it's not bad. It's just that it has this tendency to sort of close off the search for physical solutions. Um, um, it doesn't mean that it's not right, but I think it just, you know, we should, I, I think we should be conservative in giving up on physical solutions um, just because we haven't yet been clever enough to come up with one. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's move on. 
uh, since we've done so well answering those ones. Um, let's see, what was the next one? Oh, yes. So, you know, there's been a lot of industry. So Iggy and others, uh, you know, many people have worked on these modified gravity models. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, when I give talks about DES, I say, you know, we're going to try to figure out is it dark energy, is it modified gravity. Uh, but again, we have, I think there's this sense that it's really tough to come up with, um, with viable, consistent modified gravity models. Um, and so I guess, you know, the question is, um, is that telling us something or is it again just that we've, you know, we, people haven't tried hard enough? So maybe that's a question for, for Iggy. Yeah, so I think here, um, if you approach it from a point of view that, well, um, I want to modify my theory of gravity by adding something to it, something like, uh, uh, I, can, I can do this by extending it by an extra, so either you extend it by an extra degree of freedom, it's like a scalar field. Um, and um, now we basically know, I think there's a sort of proof, mathematical proof for what the most general thing you can write down is more or less along the lines that I was talking about. Now, if you were to start from saying, well, actually, it's sort of dark energy, that's some sort of extra fluid in the universe that um, happens to have perturbations in it and so on, you actually end up with exactly the same theory. So you see, there isn't really a difference, I think, between modified gravity and dark energy on this level. Um, there's the one alternative, maybe, is that there are the, the sort of massive gravity uh, models. Uh, where you're really looking at making gra adding a mass to the graviton, and that's for many many years it's been highly problematic. But I think this problem has been it's been now proven that there is a consistent theory of, of a massive graviton. Um, the irony of the whole thing is that the of course contains a sort of helicity zero mode, which uh, is uh, because now it has five it basically has five degrees of freedom, which one is a sort of normal spin two. There's a, there's a spin one which is a vector. It's a scalar, and the scalar ends up looking exactly the same. As these, uh, as, as these scalar theories that I was just talking about a moment ago. So in the end, we always end up being reduced to exactly the same space. Um, and then the argument you can make is really only about, uh, right, what is the, within this framework, what is the more natural thing to write down for the precise Lagrangian? Um, but in the end, the predictions are all exactly the same too. So I'm not really sure whether this is really a, anything that, the, that, that measurements will ever be able to tell you uh, what the original uh, cause of uh, what the modification is. Can I ask you, can I ask, oh, no. Uh, so while uh, these modifications to gravity or a new fluid uh, might be degenerate in the cosmological case, for example, when you have a scalar mode for your gravitational theory that gives you new radiation modes, which in principle the LIGO people could detect. So uh, if, you, if you go over to that domain, you can distinguish between the theories. Um, right, so in principle, if you go away from the, from the cosmology here that we're doing, yes, so the, maybe there is a... It's, I mean, it's also, I mean, there may be differences on the level of... Um, if you're really thinking about this theory and sort of non-linear as forming static structures and so on, things that are hydrostatic, uh, that come from hydrostatics, or hy things that come from hydrodynamics uh, uh, rather than from modification of gravity will, even though they're coming from a theory that's very similar, will take on different solutions. Um, so in principle, maybe there's a, there's a way of distinguishing there, but it's not on the level of looking at uh, linear structure or structure formation in general, I think, yeah. I was going to ask you, Iggy, whether you thought, I mean, a lot of people are showing WW prime plots or W, prime, w versus things, uh, the observers, and those plots didn't appear in your talks, and maybe you have something to say about what you'd like to see people observing. Right, okay, so this is a uh, question of, um, so uh, I didn't really get into this, but the W is not an observable quantity, right? So the reason why we think W is close to minus one is because we have assumed that it's a constant. Um, really what's an observable quantity and a physical quantity is just H. And actually what you find when you're, looking at the, when you're looking at the equations of all these models, they never really depend on W directly. They always depend on H or the derivatives of H and so on. So I'm not really sure whether, you see, a, a measurement, assuming that W is some constant 
and then you you know you put in it, you parameterize it, and you measure it, is not probably that going to be that that important for the understanding how the perturbations themselves evolve in a particular set of theories. Like in the end, the quantity that you that you really care about is it's just really the geometry of the of the space time, and that's about it. And in the end, that's the only thing that's actually really observable. Yeah, actually, I thought. Um I thought your question today was regarding that because you know you were talking about these gamma models, which is a single parameter model where you're just looking at growth. But you know there's this literature on on sort of model sort of two parameter models where you're looking at the difference between the two the two potentials in the perturbed metric, and you know one of them affects growth. You know you can sort of package one of them into a sort of g effective thing that affects the growth of perturbations and so on. So I thought. Well, actually, should, those, so so but there, that that's a two levels I think. So there's yeah. one is that. Uh, um, if you don't know what dark energy does, i.e., you know, you have to assume that it may cluster. And if you do that, then dark matter perturbations themselves are never observable because, you know, we're only looking at all our probes purely look at geodesic motion of either light or galaxies. So there's never any sense you can really differentiate between dark matter and dark energy if you don't know, have an idea what dark energy is doing in the first place. Um, and then sort of there's a, so this is why I was kind of trying to, to, to push this idea that there's some way of measuring this eta at least in a way that's model independent. That will tell you something um, uh, about, about the class of theories you may be in. And so the second issue which is that when you're looking at cluster counts or something like that, you have to understand the, you have to understand how the, um, in different classes of theories of, of modified gravity, the way that you convert the linear power spectrum to clusters is very different. And um, just, it's not just a question of how the background has changed or something like that, or, or really what, what sigma eight was at the time that, you, right. that, 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 that the cluster formed, but it's a much more complicated nonlinear process. Let me ask you. Uh, hey, yes, yeah. Just to mention on, on, on that and follow the discussion that we were having before and you're having now, <clears throat> essentially the problem here I think is uh, as which is related as well with one of the questions that you have later on I think is the ignorance that we're discussing here, right? The ignorance of what it is, dark energy or modification of gravity or, or something else. So the problem if we don't know what it is, we don't know how to describe it. So the, 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 what I was trying to say before as well, if you, we, we try to pick a particular model, we have a particular description, which is only valid for that particular model, which is essentially what we have with the particular model that I chose, which is a, our preferred model so far, which is GR. Uh, but, you know, and then you just le give some flexibility to the model, but uh, at the end that's just, again, a consistency test for that model, if you want to change the model, you have to, you know, maybe do another consistency test for that model. And what, 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 we're, what you're trying to do is, I mean, find in, in your talk, and as we discussed before, trying to find relevant quantities that you can measure directly the, the quantity and have some meaning by the quantity itself, not necessarily by, by the model. So to be model independent as, as possible, but of course, uh, as we discussed before, you have to pay the same price at the end. You, you need a certain amount of data, and if you want to describe uh, your uh, observations, you are, you, basically you have to you know, keep binning. So essentially you just parameterize in a different way, which is more meaningful, but of course you need a level of information that uh, it is increasing and we, we you know, depends on how much data you have now. So for the le level of data we have now, we do sensible tests and when we have more data, we'll keep moving forward. Ideally though, we'll, have, we'll like to be guided by the theory, but that's, that's evidently a problem for all these questions that we're discussing now here. I'm not sure if this is either gonna be helpful or, or different from what people have been saying, but it sort of seemed to me for quite a long time now that this sort of democratization of theories is a sort of residue of the um, amour proper of the theoretical physicists who were very disturbed by uh, for all the reasons we heard about Lambda and all the rest of it. And uh, speaking as a theoretical physicist, I would say get over it. Um, we have one singular theory 
just as we had with general relativity. It is nearly a century old, including the cosmology cosmological constant. It is very prescriptive. It says A goes the size to the two-thirds T and gamma is six-elevenths. Um, try and falsify it. That was exactly what happened in the 70s and 80s with general relativity. It was a gloriously successful program. It was parameterized with the series of GHP formalisms and all the rest of it that you know nobody, nobody remembers now. But every test, it has survived. It doesn't mean it's right, but it, the challenge then was to falsify it. And so whatever technique you have, whatever survey, whatever um, approach, you find the regime where you can best put that one singular theory to the test. Sure, somebody may come up with a, a very good alternative theory, which was shown to be correct. But as where we stand at the moment, it seems that is the challenge of uh, ob observational astronomy and, and experimental physics. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's a fine attitude to take. The, the concern I have is uh, is to include in that your statement that the challenge is to falsify it because I think there's a large section of the theoretical community that just assumes that's the right theory. Why are, you know, why are we bothering doing these surveys? Um, you know, it's clearly, that's clearly the right answer, so. Yeah. I would also disagree with that. I mean, you, all, you have the wherewithal to test an exciting prescriptive right. theory and you should go off and test it. it yeah. Look, we, I used to teach Einstein to city universes because that was the simple prescriptive theory right. and, and the data at the time, bad as it was, was entirely consistent with it, I would say, given, right. given the large error bars. And it was a reasonable thing to do and it was falsified. And, you know, yeah. and I think that, that in some sense is a description of what happened in cosmological observations is many people thought, thought that that was the simple natural theory and it was falsified yeah. observationally. Uh, I, I have a general discussion question, which is then there, there have been some proposals recently. Uh, the one that comes to mind is using the so-called trace-free Einstein equations, which basically allow you to ignore the vacuum energy contribution to a cosmological constant, in which case you have no theoretical prejudice for what it should be and it's just an integration constant. Uh, and I'm curious as to what people think of that kind of approach to the problem, that it's just it's a fundamental constant of nature. you know. We don't go around trying to explain the value of C or H bar or any of the other fundamental constants that appear. Well, some people do, but most of us are happy just measuring them. Uh, what do people think about that kind of an approach? It's a little defeatist, but uh, you know, it might be where you end up. Well, but I think I think that's that's not really right. So the we do worry about fundamental constants. For example, the you know, electron mass, right? That sort of comes from some coupling to the Higgs. Um, it's a little bit low, but in the end, it's okay. It's sort of the order, that, that dimension is coupling is 10 minus three, right? And they are basically, out of, all the, out of all the physical constants, the only ones we, we are uncertain about is the mass of the Higgs, as a, I guess as a fraction of M Planck. And that should be, that should be large, we'd guess, and we're worried about when people, you know, people work, the LHC was built exactly to measure that particular problem, you know, to, to address that particular problem. And then the other thing that doesn't seem to make sense is exactly this, this lambda, that it, it, we'd expect it to be that much larger. The, all the other constants are more or less fine, I think. Maybe apart from the, uh, 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 the QCD, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the, the one that the axioms were invented to, to solve. Theta, for theta exactly. Theta QCD. So maybe that's the only one that's not, you know, that's just not. But otherwise, you, you do worry about the fact that the electron is a bit low, and then you say, well, it's, it's okay. Well, you worry about it because you have an expectation for what it should be, right? You have a fundamental scale there. And, and so if you, if you remove the theoretical motivation, the, the Planck mass scale in the problem, then it's just a number. But I mean, but there is, but there is a Planck, right? Which is, I mean, lambda is no longer, it's a number, it's a dimension. It's a... Um, I mean, if you just yeah. look at it from, from the classical Einstein perspective, mm -hmm. right, it's just an integration constant. It, you have no expectation for what it should be. Right. Uh, there is, but... I don't, I don't know if what I'm about to say is right, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I think another way of phrasing this question is that, you know, we're used to thinking of lambda as weird because just historically we happen to have GC and H bar first, right? And, and there's a question of, you know, if we had seen GC and lambda first, 
would we be worrying about the value of lambda or would we, we, or would we be worrying about the value of h bar, right? I, I, I don't know if that's actually equivalent to what you're saying, but it sounded to me similar, so that, that's why. Right, exactly. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem of a ratio, right? And we think of it as a lambda problem because lambda was the last one to the party. Well, <laughs> people say lambda, they say lambda over lambda in terms of a short and take. That's what is meant when you say lambda is a problem. Lambda over lambda. I think Bob has a. Okay, uh, to zero order, I agree with what Roger said. Okay, about testing GR in the standard model. Uh, next order, the question is, can think, thinking more broadly, theoretically, suggest new classes of observations and experiments, okay? Yeah. So that, that's where I stand. Yeah. Can I just try to throw a, something, I think things are historical. Um, in the 1930s, Eddington, who does not have a good record in fundamental theory, um, uh, nonetheless uh, wrote in popular and technical books that he firmly believed in the cosmological constant, um, partly because that the un he thought the universe should be older than its contents, and that's still a good argument, or the numbers changed significantly, um, and, and this is perhaps relevant to the you know, point that you brought up, um, that he knew about small things like atoms and nuclei and he knew about large things, which is the universe, and there had to be, his argument, which is an inversion of the way that people think about it nowadays, not necessarily a good one, is that there had to be something very large, there had to be a very large number to characterize the, the size of the universe in the presence of atoms and nuclei. And so it isn't as though Lambda is late to the party, I mean, it was there in 1917. Um, and it's just, it's just perhaps the, the, the intellectual path that we have followed through the glorious successes of atomic, nuclear, and particle, and physics, and beyond, against this background of, you know, a, a, a cosmology. It's the, it's the observational cosmology that I think is late to the party. And the, you know, what, what's sort of called rather uh, optimistically precision cosmology, but it should be actually accurate, accurate cosmology. Um, 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 the, um, it's that that is, that is, you know, that is, that is late to the party. And I think, um, you know, and it, it, the opportunity, I completely agree with Bob that, you know, to think up, you know, better and more different ways, of, you should be poking at this model as hard as you can. And maybe something, it'd be lovely if somebody could find something that was, you know, five sigma wrong from the, the, from the model. That would be a fantastic outcome. And I think mean, lots, lots, I mean, lots of people are, try, are trying hard to do that. And I, and I hope they succeed. So I, I, I know we need to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but I, that's actually a good segue into the last question I wanted to raise, which is, so how hard do we need to poke at this model? Um, and you know, when should we, we give up? You know, we've now got, so DES has started, LSST is gonna happen, there'll be Euclid, hope, perhaps there'll be W first, there's DESI, you know, we have a kind of roadmap for the next 10, 15 years. Um, is that sufficient? Should we just wait and see where we get with that? Uh, or should we be thinking about, you know, trying to go to he even higher levels of either precision or accuracy? Um, and, uh, you know, at some point it's, you know, so LSST is sort of, you know, well, so DES is kind of, you know, it was about $50 million to build. LSST is hundreds of millions, you know, going beyond that, things get expensive. Uh, and at some point, you know, you reach this inflection point in the precision, you know, the cost per precision curve. Um, have we reached that point? Um, or should we be thinking even, is this problem so important uh, that we should be thinking even more ambitiously um, beyond, you know, what's, what's currently on the table? So that's... I'm curious what, what people's thinking is. Or, or are people just so saturated with what they're doing now that they just can't even conceive of, uh, no. I think we have to observe the part of the universe that we can observe. 
And I, I, I just think we have to do it. And, right. and dark so energy is, so, so I would say the cosmic variance limit. Yeah, so just and, do it until you're. And I mean, that's, exactly what the best methods are to, to, to do that, I think we have to be strategic about and have to take budgets into consideration when we think about Because that's, that's sort of what's happening in the CMB game, right? Right. And you know, eventually the ultimate polarization experiment will get done and then they'll go do something else, I assume. But, so should we do, you know, do we need to do that with, with these other sorts of observations? Um, well, one thing I would say is, so I agree with Risa that our responsibility as astronomers is to measure everything we can measure, and we should keep doing that. Um, and, and I want to do that. And, and of course, the rate at which we do that is going to depend very much on, on externalities that are way beyond our pay grade. But, uh, uh, but I think it's an interesting question whether people will remain interested in cosmology. And I don't know if you remember that this that set of debates between uh, Rocky Kolb and Simon White about, like, has cosmology turned into uh, particle physics, which for them for for them was bad. Well, for uh, which you know, uh, which you know, but in that debate, Rocky made a very nice point, which was that cosmology is interesting as long as young people who are very good want to do cosmology. And I think, and I, th that was a strange way to phrase it. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but I think at some level that is going to be the limiting factor for this. And it sort of goes slightly against what Roger said, because I agree with Roger too, that when we have a very prescriptive theory, we should beat the crap out of it. But at some point, uh, people will give up. Uh, or they'll, so stop, they'll stop paying for it. And so uh, during that, those arguments, one, one of the other points that Rocky made a lot was you can do a lot of astrophysics from the, you know, which is different than particle physics, which is, it's just a lot different than that, uh, which is looking really for some kind of specific answers. Uh, and, you know, Simon, Simon Screed didn't really respond to that, that kind of issue, I would say. And Simon was a member of SDSS, by the way. Uh, so that's kind of along the lines of what I was going to say. The astrophysics is, um, I think that people in general, I think it's right now for sure the case that um, cosmology is a bigger draw for money than astrophysics is. And um, we should kind of use the funding that we can get in cosmology, I guess, to push to higher precision because also, like, in pushing to higher precision, we're doing much better astrophysics uh, than we would do otherwise. And I think that, you know, nobody would give us this, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to study galaxy morphology. Somebody said this to me at lunch yesterday. <laughs> um, but so, they so will this is to, all just a very, w. this is all just a very clever ploy by the astronomers. Uh, um, no. <laughs> yes. OK, well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I'm just, I think that, uh, you know, pushing to higher precision also means that we can do things in astrophysics that, um, that are beyond just pushing down our error bars. Um, so I think that it, it's, it's important to kind of like, to look at both of those aspects, the cosmology side of things, and, and also what we can do in astrophysics, but uh, just, keep talking about cosmology, because that way we can get more funding and stuff. <laughs> All right, any final comments? I guess I have a small comment. It's related to things we've talked about already. Uh, but all the things we've talked about, about in terms of measuring dark energy and so on have been related to gravitational measurements. Right? And distinction between gravi modified gravity or dark energy, I think it's, it doesn't have any relevance as long as you're only making gravitational measurements, you can't, because you can't distinguish the two. So are there any ideas around about non-gravitational measurements, about what couplings, if you write down a scale of theory, what kind of couplings you expect to normal matter where we could do non-gravitational measurements, and that way we could actually distinguish between models? Because here, as long as you're doing gravitational measurements, you're not going to be able to tell what, what the difference is. So I want to thank all the speakers uh, and all, everyone for, for an interesting discussion. Thanks. <laughs>